Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. Weimar Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Ray Hypo, Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. Pete Jackaloni, South Hills Assembly God Church, Bethel Park, PA. J. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of another level in the North Hills area. Well, pastors, thank you for being with us. These are some awesome men of God, and you are blessed to hear them. I'm blessed to hear what they have to say today. So today on Hard Questions, we're taking on your questions from the hotline. So let's get started with our first one. Hello. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, the scripture indicates, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And in Isaiah 53, verse 12, and he was, he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might bear, that he might be, be bear the righteousness of God in him. My question has to do with the fact that I was always taught that Christ died for all. And these scriptures seem to indicate that he died for many. So my question is this, did he die for all in the, in the world or did he die only for, for many? Okay, continuing a conversation we had on another show a little bit here, I think, but uh, Pete, why don't you kick us off well, here? I have to go to, to the most infamous scripture. I mean, they're all valuable, they're all important, but John 3, 16, it's very clear. For God so loved, not a portion of the world, for God so loved the entire world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should never perish but have everlasting life. I've, I have to cling to that, for God so loved. Then in Romans 5, 18, it says, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all, a -double -L, all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. I still believe that the blood of Jesus Christ is efficacious for all, oh, whosoever okay. will. Whosoever will. And I, I would go to uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, and it says, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That word propitiation means to appease the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. That when Jesus died on the cross, He took the wrath of God for all mankind. So, you know, to me, that's a clear evidence right there that uh, he died for the sins of all men. Yeah. Okay. So all sin is well atoned for. I think it's just a play on words. I'm just going to okay. break it down real easy for okay. you. Because uh, if you look at Romans 5 as well, it says here, but the free gift is not like the offense for by one man's offense, many died. Well, all died. Yeah. We all died under sin. It wasn't yeah. many. It was all, it's just the wording that he's using. And you have to remember there's translation. You're looking at a New King James or things like that. So it's, when you look at the original text, it's alluding to everyone. But then it also says, just so they say, well, that was for the many offenses. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Well, it was to all, but right up above that, it does say all. So it's a play on words, but he's alluding to the fact that it's, everyone. So whether it says he took the sins of many or he it, it's still alluding to everybody and according to even what Pete read, it's all is all and many is all and it means there's a lot of, there's a lot of many's in all. All is all, all. and it's all, <laughs> all means. <laughs> all right, right. All right, I'm going to be the odd man out. Um, we're talking about the atonement of Jesus Christ right. and there are basically three views. There's the universalist view, there's the Arminian view, and there's the Calvinist view. And the atonement can only be limited, and that's what we're talking about, is the atonement limited. It can only be limited in two ways, in extent or in efficacy. The only group that says the atonement is entirely unlimited are the universalists. The universalists say Jesus died for everybody 
and everybody gets saved. It's not limited in extent. It's not limited in efficacy. Both the Arminians and the Calvinists agree that the atonement has to be limited because there are real people that go to hell. If Bible's Jesus, very clear on that. If Jesus died for everybody that, yes. and paid for the sins of everybody, God can't charge them again when their sins are already paid for. We believe, all of us believe, that only those who tr trust in Christ are ultimately going to get the effects of the atonement and be saved. Therefore, we're limiting the efficacy. Christ's death was, was not enough uh, to save everybody. In, now, in, in the sense in here is in what way? And now, the Arminians and the Calvinists dis differ on this. The Arminians will differ, and, and all of you have articulated this view, that the atonement was universal in extent. Christ did die for everybody but not in efficacy because not everybody's saved. Right. The Calvinists turn that around. We believe that Christ's atonement is fully efficacious right. for everyone for whom he died, uh, but he didn't die for everybody. And so in the will of God, uh, again, in the eternal plan of God, God has an elect based in himself, not in what he would see they would do. That would make him a respecter of persons. He has chosen to save some, though none deserve it. And I think our caller picked up on some of those verses. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I lay down for my, the, my life for the sheep. And they will hear my voice and they will come. And all will come I will by no means cast out. You do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Notice he doesn't say you're not of my sheep because you don't believe. But you're, you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. And there are you know, many other places. Christ uh, purchased the church with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, Ephesians 5, 25. Um, Christ, was offered, uh, Christ offered to bear the sins of many, to give his life for a ransom of many, his people. Uh, and, and those passages which say all, I would say they refer to all sorts of people, all the peoples you know, of every tribe, tongue, nation, but not everyone in those nations. Well, let, me, let me ask you, because I, I kind of want to <laughs> insert myself in the discussion here because of John 3.16. Again, yeah. I actually uh, heard a, a Calvinist brother say he didn't really know what it meant. Uh, uh, what do you say when it says that, what Pete said, that, you know, that, you know, that all who believe, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life? I affirm that. That's absolutely true. That verse says nothing about for whom Christ died. It, it, is, it says nothing about the extent of the intention of the atonement. Uh, we have verses that say that. I lay down my, my life for the sheep. Uh, um, at one point Jesus says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. But for those whom you have given me out of the world, for they are yours. And so again, we have this idea that there were these people that were gods. God gave them to Jesus. Jesus died for them. But he won't even pray for the world, yeah, and yet we think he'll lay down his life for the world. It's a lot easier to say a few words. I just want to read a quick scripture, and it's yours. 2 yeah. Corinthians 5, it says, For the love of Christ compels because we judged us, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, mm -hmm. but for him who died for them and rose again. So by the scripture there, I, from my stake on it, from what I'm seeing there, he died for everybody. Let's go and and I would go back to the verse that, you know, and this is why I was putting my hat at, is the fact that he is a propitiation, not for our sins only, not for the right. elect, right. not for those right. who have been predestined, but for the sins of the whole world. You know, to me, John is making a distinction in saying that he shed his blood, not only for the elect, but for the whole world. And if I could just say, and, and, and I think that's, that's, that's the verse you want to go to. That makes a strong argument. But I think if we take that just at the surface, then, then we have to go back to the universalist position. Because if Jesus really did propitiate God for the sins of the whole world, let's not talk about needing to believe in Jesus anymore. Because the whole world is going to heaven. And therefore, what I understand that verse to be saying is John is saying to the people he's writing, not just for us, not just for our time, not just for you Ephesians, not just, but for the whole world. That is, for all those who are ever saved, they're going to be saved because Christ shed his blood for them. But what John is not saying is everyone who ever lived in all the world is going to heaven. But if he's the propitiation well, for the whole world. 
I, I, I would agree so with that. So there's got to be a limit yeah, there yeah. in some way on what he's saying for the whole world. Well, well, he died for all, but we still have to make a decision. Exactly. And I think that's what we kind of rule yeah, out. Yeah. It's not like, well, he died for all, so that means all are saved. Right. Because now we get into an inclusion piece, uh, which we know we don't believe that. But the reality is, is that if he died for all, we still have to, that's the whole purpose of the good news. Now, even in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, it says that yeah. it, the word was brought to them, but didn't, it wasn't mixed yeah. with faith, so it did not profit them. So that's kind of where I think we differ a little bit is that it's not the fact that he didn't die. We believe that he died for all, but we still have to make a decision. And just saying that he died for all doesn't mean that all are saved. But so then the, the right. limit is right. on the efficacy. What he did wasn't enough. We have to add something to it to make no, it work. No, we have to believe in believe. him and shall not perish. Right. Yeah, we have, have everlasting. Choose. My understanding is the reason I believe is because Christ died for me. He, in time, takes away my unbelief. I would go to uh, Acts 16, 14. Um, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things told by Paul. Why did the Lord open her heart? Because Christ died for her. And that's what has to happen. Christ dies for us, ensures we will come to faith. Um, and, the, and in his atoning work, he has a people that he's looking to. Wow. Great discussion, <laughs> and we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to ask, how many heavens are there? We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. We're taking your calls from the hard question hotline. Now, if you would like to leave us your question, I hope you do. We encourage you to call 412-349-4326. We'd love to answer your question on the air. Let's go to the next one. My question is, why were the Israelites in Egypt for 430 years before Moses was able to lead them out of the out? of Egypt into the wilderness and into the promised land. Uh, was it punishment? Was there a significance to that number of 430 years? I've never been able to figure that out. Thank you. Okay, good question. 430 years, that's a long time to go through a trial. Pastor Jay. You know, I'm gonna go to uh, Genesis 15, uh, 13 through 16. And the uh, reason why I mention this too, real quickly, just a little caveat here. I think it's so important, and I know we all do this, but something that's been more and more in my heart as a pastor is to make sure I don't give them what I know, but take them to where it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, because sometimes they're just saying, oh, that's what Pastor Jay said. Oh, that's what Pastor yeah. Pete said. Yeah. Well, no, let me take you to the scriptures. Right. Yeah. Genesis 15, yeah. 13 says, then he said to Abraham, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge them. So that's important to know. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Right. Now as for you, shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So I think he gives us two reasons right. there yep, as can. to why they need to uh, be in that time. One, they need to come out with possessions because when Moses, asked, right. I think it's in Numbers 25, mm -hmm. if I'm not saying, when he asked for an offering, right. they didn't have anything as slaves. So the first thing that had to happen is Egypt had to, he, they had to spoil Egypt. Oh, yes. So then when they came out, they could be a nation and have substance and have wealth and be able to build that. Right. But then also for God to judge the Amorites, which he was gonna give them that land, they had not, his grace and That's mercy right. had not been totally expended yet. That's right. He had to give them the opportunity to get to that so full the measure. of the Amorites, that's not what that is. That it hadn't been fulfilled yet. Yep, and yeah. then he can bring judgment upon Egypt and upon the Amorites okay. and give the children of Israel an opportunity to go in and establish the promised land. That's okay. absolutely right, and I would totally agree, and I had that same passage to go to, because God doesn't, you know, God's not gonna give Israel, his chosen people, and he chose them, but he's not going to despoil the other folks until they have run his patience out. And God yeah. is patient. And long. He's patient with the wicked. He's long suffering with, with those vessels of wrath that he, that he bears with for a long time. So, um, you know, that, that's exactly what we're seeing here. It's God's mercy. God's not going to judge them until they've sinned so much that the land, as it were, vomits them out. And it's 400, you know, 430 years. Um, Abraham's given the round number 400 years. Yeah, in, let me, let me yeah. just, uh, why does it say 400 in one place, 430 because in another place? a generation, the word door in Hebrew, originally meant lifetime, okay. all right? And at that time, they're living over 100 years. So on the one hand, he says 400 years, but then he says in the fourth generation, each generation is 100 years, clearly. So sometime in the fourth generation, sometimes in the 400th years, 
Right. And we know specifically right. it turns out to be 430. That will happen. But one other place, uh, Jesus says to the Jews of his day, fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. And then he talks about the wrath coming upon that generation going way back so that, again, even at the time of, of, of Israel being judged in 70 A.D., um, that, was, that was centuries worth of God's patience with them until finally he brings judgment. Same thing with the Amorites. All right, great. Anything else? Well, uh, these guys said it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, know, you know what? I always think about something, though, before we get to the next question, because that's a long time, 400 years. And I think about the guy that's maybe 200 years into that, trying <laughs> to believe God for, you know, hey, God, God's promised. We're going to go to this promised land. He promised to Abraham, and he's believing but he doesn't see it. He doesn't see it. Sometimes yeah. things are, are multi-generational before the promise comes, right. to, comes yeah. to pass. Well, Hebrews 11, many of these died in faith, but yet believed and embraced, even though yeah. they never saw it. Well, we, need... we as a Christian still look to the future, right? Right, right. Yeah. We have promises that haven't been fulfilled yet. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, let's go on to our next hotline question. Hi, my question is, Apostle Paul states that he got called up to the to the third heaven. And I know when we die, it says to be absent with the body is to be present with God, but I'm just like, how many heavens, is there a second and a third heaven or are we all together when we die? It's just kind of confusing. Thanks, bye. Okay, the third heaven, interesting question, Pastor Glaze. Well, I'm, I'm gonna go to the scripture, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <laughs> uh, Paul says, I knew a man, he was speaking of himself, above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows. And such a one was caught up into the third heaven. Mm -hmm. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows. He was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. So, you know, I, and, and I, I can see how the uh, uh, caller is, is, is confused because what she uh, seems like might be thinking about, well, you know, some people go to the first heaven uh, when we die, and some people go to the second heaven when we die, and some people go to the third heaven, and so are there three different places that we go? Mm -hmm. So that's the question that I believe she's asking. But in, in this right here, when Paul speaks of the third heaven, you know, the, the, the first heaven would be the expanse, mm -hmm. where the birds fly, mm -hmm. where the clouds are. The second heaven, <clears throat> the second heaven would be the, the planets, mm -hmm. you know, and the third heaven, and Paul tells us what the third heaven is right here. He says that it's paradise, you right. know, that, that, that yeah. place of perfection, that place where God abides. So the third heaven is actually the heaven that we're all going to go to. Uh, so when we, when we look at that, you know, those are the three heavens. Okay. I agree. I got it right here. The, the immediate atmosphere of the birds, first heaven, second heaven is the outer space, the third heaven is the home of God. I've got it right here. I, got, I drew a little world. And I, was sort of like, <laughs> I got a diagram in my notes here. That, and that was the scientific else? view of the ancient world, that there really was a spiritual abode of God, uh -huh. and they, they put it in the third heaven. So, uh, but uh, the first two heaven, they're natural places. Right. They're yeah. places that we could travel to if we have a rocket yeah. ship or yeah. whatever. But the third heaven isn't like that. The third heaven is a spiritual place. It's a, right. a, a place that we, it's not within the realm of this physical world right. or right. physical yeah. universe. Right. So, you know, the interesting thing, I often use this illustration, that if you got on a rocket ship and you travel for all eternity, you know, throughout the regions yeah. of space, you, you'd never get there. That's right. you, you'd to never quote, get to heaven. To quote that great theologian, to infinity and beyond. Okay. <laughs> what well, like, yeah. yeah. well, <laughs> All right. All right. It's a good question, though. Very interesting. Well, coming up, are we conforming to this world? Stay tuned for that. Welcome back to, to Hard Questions. We're so glad that you're with us. Let's take our last hotline question. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world. Isn't that what we are all doing is conforming with this technology, TikTok, mm. digital currency? Are we not just all conforming <clears throat> to what the world offers? Okay. 
Good question. Let's go to Pastor Jay. Well, you know, the Bible says that uh, in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, it talks about the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. I think they're phenomenal passages of scripture. And I think a lot of times people understand, people always ask the question, and I'm going somewhere on this, but what, that's the question, how is it that people in the world are blessed? Well, you have to remember there is ideologies, philosophies and that govern the the God, of, the God of this world that he orchestrates. That's how Adam and Eve, they fell into that part in the garden. They believed his philosophy as a result. They took a hold of the tree that was forbidden, believed that and did that. So what am I saying to you? In this question that he's asking, he's asking technology, currency, uh, and TikTok, social media. Those are tools. They're not beliefs. It's what you do with TikTok that determines if you're conforming to the world. It's what you do with your money. It's the, that's why he said in Romans 12, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. So when we're yes. talking about conf confirmation or transformation, it's dealing with how we operate. It's the principles and the precepts that we allow our life to be governed by. So we're only conforming to the world uh, if we are doing with technology things contrary to the world, if we're doing things with social media contrary to the, wor uh, contrary to the word of God rather. Right. or with our currency, mm -hmm. where it's contrary to the word of God. It's what we do so with it's it. It's not about the, the technology is neutral. Or the money, yeah. right. or, or the, the media. Yeah. It's about how we use it. So you have to ask yourself the question, are you going to use those tools as an agent for God or are you going to be a tool by those things that the world is offering? Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that too. I, I think that... Um, you know, there may be some confusion in the, in the caller sort of looking at things like, well, if I look like the world, then I'm conforming to the world. And I, and I don't believe that's what Paul's saying. I mean, it, this is an important distinction to make. So I think the caller really, you know, brought up something that we, we need to affirm that number one, and we've all heard this, we need to be in the world, but not of, of the, the world. world. And, and I'd, like, I'd like to give the caller a few other scriptures to just really sort of come down on what Paul's talking about. First Peter 1 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to what? To the former lusts as in your ignorance. All right. But as he who has call, called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Right. So there's a good distinction there. Don't be like you were before, ignorant, acting out of lusts, right. sinful desires, but be holy. That's how we're not conformed. When we're holy, how are we holy? When we do what God tells us to do, when we believe in Christ. Uh, one other place, Ephesians 4, 17. This I say then and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. What does he mean? Having their understanding darkened, mm -hmm. being, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance again that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all unclean, with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. So there's the distinction again. Right, yeah. So here's the worldliness, yeah. greediness, lust, ignorance, sin, hatred, etc., etc. Here's being not like the world, being in Christ, living right. for Christ right. uh, over that's and over again. Good. So that's what we're talking about here, this spiritual putting on the, the new man and getting off the old man. Yeah, again, I want, and that's really a great explanation. And I think we're, we're coming down on this thing of... Yeah. These things, TikTok, cryptocurrency, right. whatever, right. we're not saying one thing's a good decision, but it's not morally right. evil. I, again, in a nutshell, worldly ways that are contrary against God. That's yeah. a very small nutshell. We're, so again, we're not talking about TikTok. Now, can TikTok be evil? Yeah. Can it be oh. good? Yes. Modern technology, I, I tell you what, I am so grateful for my laptop. I get more accomplished on that laptop, and, and, and for those who think, oh, but it's evil, I'll hand my laptop to anybody in this world, you're welcome to examine it. You, you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Because the day I got it, I, I, I committed it to the Lord. I said, Lord, yes, there could be evil here, but there's far much more good than, it's what we do with it. It's what we do with it, yeah. Well, I, I like what one commentator said. Uh, he said, don't be stained with the veneer he said that, you know, underneath we are Christians and there's a veneer that we are slacked with. And if we are using TikTok in the world, you know, with the, with the world's veneer, you know, that we are Christians underneath, but our veneer is of the world. He said, let your interior match your exterior. So we use these things for his honor and glory. Yeah, we can, there are, <laughs> Cautions. There should be cautions with things. Sure. One of the problems with 
having everything in the world in your pocket is everything's available to you at all time on your phone. So that's, there have to be cautions, certainly. Just real quickly, I think one of the things that it's very important, I eventually want to do a conference on, I think we should be aware of the dangers of AI that's coming. Ooh. I think how the internet came and took us by storm, I think AI is going to present even greater dangers. And to that question, I think we need to really be cautious as we're moving forward so with that. we need to be wise yeah. as we move forward in this. I you look a like- a short point to make. Yeah, Tom, I know we're running out of time, but I do think that the church has erred. Christians have erred here in the past, you know, making rules like women can't wear makeup or you oh, can't yeah. go to movies. or So we certainly can go too far and bar things that in and of themselves aren't yep. bad, but it's what we're making, what we're doing with them. That's right. right. Very good. Very good discussion. Well, we like to end the program with the scripture. And to, today we go to 1 John where it says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's 1 John Four ten. We hope that you enjoyed today's program and we want to hear from you. Email us your questions to hardquestions at ctvn.org or call the hotline 412-349-4326. God bless you. Have a wonderful day as you walk with him.